Wessels, Director of Christian Answers. I want to thank you for being with me today. We're covering a certain topic here along the lines of the Islamic faith. This is a, more of a specialized topic. It's The title of our series here is Answering Islamic Apologists. Now, a lot of people probably don't know what an apologist is, but an apologist is, just, is simply somebody that he, he, he believes his religion, and he's going to uh, proclaim his religion and say it's true, and he'll give reasons why his religion's true, and at the same time, he'll argue that other religions are false, and he'll give reasons why those religions are false, and he'll defend his, his faith against attacks against it. So an apologist is basically somebody who, who uh, is proclaiming their religion, defending their religion, and, and basically attacking other religions at the same time. Uh, it's something that someone that's truly committed their religion does, and we find the same thing in Christianity, especially if you look at like uh, Jude 3 in the Bible, there's something called Christian apologists, and they are told by Jude in verse 3 to earnestly contend or to fight or to wrestle, as the Greek gets into it, for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. So they get in there, you know, and they fight and wrestle or grapple with falsehoods and, and untruths. And as you know from Jude, if you're familiar with it in the Bible, he's talking about false prophets as he goes on to talk about in verse 4 and following. So dealing or answering Muslim apologists, what we're doing is we're going to deal with these guys in Islam that say their religion's true, uh, all the other religions are false, particularly Christianity is false, and Jesus didn't die on a cross, and Jesus didn't shed his blood, and Jesus isn't God, and all these things that they say, we're going to be dealing and trying to answer them in this series. Well, this is show number three in this series, and we're just going to simply pick up where we left off before we're basically dealing with uh, our main focus is on one of the major Muslim apologists in North America, Dr. Jamal Badawi. This is one of his tape sets uh, called Islamic Teachings. This one's basically here is covering Jesus, the beloved messenger of Allah, uh, although we're on one of his other tape sets at the moment. But I took the time to listen to all these tapes. These are the soundtracks from his television shows. And we have volume after volume sitting here between Steve and me down here, but uh, we're going to try to answer the arguments uh, and claims that Dr. Battle we makes. He'll be our main focus, although we will deal, deal with some of the other Muslim apologists and, and their uh, claims as well. Okay, and joining me is uh, our Director of Research for Christian Answers, Steve Morrison. Great to have you here, brother. Thank you, Doug. Uh, I uh, Really appreciate the expertise you brought to uh, this analysis, all the study and research you've done over the years, basically, as we've uh, analyzed Islam. All the many television shows we've done on it in the past. We, in fact, I don't know if the viewers can see behind us, but back here we have our eight-hour video series on Islam that uh, Steve and myself did. And, of course, we've done many, many, many more hours of uh, shows on Islam on a wide range of subjects that are available through our ministry. Uh, but you also notice behind us here, as long as I'm dealing with it, I've got Josh McDowell's book, Evidence That Demands a Burke, another one of Josh McDowell's book. I've got an Islamic book, uh, uh, basic Islamic teachings we got from Pakistan. Uh, back here we've got all the uh, Islamic uh, hadiths such as al-Bakari and Sith Muslim and so forth and other writings and, and resources that we've had at our, at our uh, availability to do this research. Uh, but one reason I, I did point out Josh Medall's stuff is because Dr. Badawi doesn't like his stuff, so I figured, well, let's give that Josh a <laughs> free plug. That is an excellent Christian apologetic book. It's This was the out-of-date one. Steve, uh, you pointed out in the previous show that he's got a new update. Uh, there, one. There, there's a, a new updated one that's very, very good, uh, the new evidence that demands a verdict. And, and it was done, I think, like 15, 20 years after the other one. So, okay, so it's so like it a two-decade difference, so he's really added to it. Yep. More impact and excellent for any Christian's library. Because when you're out there in a real real world and you're a Christian and you want to proclaim Christ and you're trying to tell people, let me tell you, it's, it's, it's hard, it's a tough r road to go because you're running the, the Muslims who've been armed by the kind of arguments that we'll be talking about with Dac Dr. Badawi or uh, these Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormons or any number of different religious perspectives. You've got the atheists, you've got the skeptics out there. They're all out to get you as a Christian and try to argue that you're wrong and your religion's worthless. And then they try to argue. So as a Christian, we can't uh, 
say enough how valuable uh, Josh McDowell's works are in this subject to uh, give uh, validity to the reliability of the Bible and why you can put your trust in it from archaeological evidence, from prophetic evidence, from uh, uh, historical manuscript evidence. There's just a wide range of evidences that substantiate the truth of the, the Christian Bible and the faith. So with that said, let's pick up where we left off last time in show number three here in answering Islamic apologists. Uh, last time we left off in Badawi's uh, first uh, tape series that we were doing, and we were still uh, in tape number six at the back end. I'm not going to reiterate for la la lack of time, but basically to pick up where we left off, uh, Badawi, uh, and you can see it on your screen here, Letter, uh, letter H, Badawi does not like the Bible saying Isaac was Abraham's only son, end quote. And there's a reference uh, to Surah 37. And also, uh, letter I, many big historical facts that are different between the Bible and Quran. This is what Badawi brings out. He brings out many uh, big and uh, wide historical facts that show there's a difference between what the Quran says about certain historical facts and what the Bible says. And some of the examples he uses is like his, the Quran talks about Mary being under a palm tree and how he shook the palm tree and knocked a fig loose so she could get some food. And uh, also about the story about Jesus turning clay into birds and things of this nature. He's bringing up stories that you find in the Quran about Jesus and Mary, but you don't find in the Bible. So, uh, Steve, just for a quick comment so we can move along. Uh, we kind of touched on this before when you covered the er earlier points he made on this tape. Any quick comment before we go on to tape number seven? Uh, well, uh, the Quran actually doesn't. Uh, the problem they have with, uh, with Isaac being Abraham's only son is that Ishmael, according to the Bible, also was born first. All right. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, is that uh, Isaac was Abraham's only son in two ways. He was the only son, meaning the, the son of promise. Mm -hmm. uh, and also Ishmael may have been sent away at that time. So he, and, and of course, Abraham also had other children uh, besides Isaac and Ishmael, but they were later. You know? um, so he was the only son that, that, that was with him, and he was the son of promise. That's right, because uh, of what you just said. And any, anyone that checks a biblical reference will see that that's what the Bible says. But, but in Islam, Islam makes a big deal about Ishmael. You know, Abraham's other son. And they try to say they're descendants of Ishmael. And, uh, you know, when you go to the Hajj pilgrimage in Mecca, they got a lot of rites and rituals associated with Abraham and also animal sacrifices related to Abraham and Ishmael, as they talk about. So this is a big thing in their uh, Islamic beliefs. So naturally, they got to, you know, they look down on this idea in the Bible that says that Isaac was the son of promise and uh, was considered Abraham's only truly legitimate son. So naturally, this is why Badawi would kind of blast that idea, because if you go with what the Bible says, that Ishmael, uh, he's not the... The Bible says that Ishmael is not the God of promise. I mean, not the uh, man of promise. Child according of promise, to God, yeah. Right, the child of promise according to God's covenant. It was Isaac, not Ishmael. Ishmael's left out of God's covenant. And so basically, Ishmael is in a heap of trouble as far as God's concerned. But... Uh, this is this one reason this is brought up by Badawi. We won't go into any more of that. And, of course, there are going to be big historical facts uh, different between the Quran and the Bible because, uh, you know, the Quran is saying many vastly different things than what the Bible says. For instance, like Jesus was not crucified. It says that. And it says many other things which we'll get into. Before I let Steve jump in on this, I'd like to say as you, you look at these points, he talks about uh, Muhammad being an unlettered man that he... You know, he couldn't read or write, and there's no way he could come up with this marvelous Quran and all these things he's saying if he was so uneducated and so unlettered and everything like that. But, you know, they say the same thing about Joseph Smith Jr. and the Book of Mormon. I could give a Book of Mormon to, uh, to uh, a Muslim, and he'd probably look, look at it and laugh. There's a lot of religious books out there that have claims like this, and the Muslims using this very same argument that Badu would use uh, would laugh at that argument if it were some other religion that they, they didn't believe in. So I say, I say right away his argument's invalid here just because 
he's un, how do I really know he's unlettered? And if you checked our show number one in here, Steve has already gone into this in some, some detail, but we don't want to be constantly repeating ourselves. But in show number one, check what Steve says there on being an unlettered man. And maybe it's not like Badawi says. Maybe, maybe Muhammad was a lot more educated or at least knew how to read a little bit and, and understand some business know-how better than uh, he's being led, we're being led to believe by these Muslim apologists. Steve, uh, what about this idea of the Bible being wrong because there's no way the Bible could be right that the whole world was covered with a flood and it was only just a local flood that killed off the people that lived around Noah. All right. Well, by the way, there are a few Christians who have what I believe is erroneous view that the that the flood is local also because the word for earth can can mean land. Mm -hmm. uh, but if the flood were local, that, that then let's you know for either um, Badawi or for these Christians, and let's think about this. So Moses, so Noah spent a long time, you know, maybe a hundred years, building this ark instead of just migrating, you know, fifty, five hundred miles away. That, that that would seem kind of kind of crazy, and also it it uh, the Quran, to my knowledge, does not specify that the flood was local, and so I think it's the same issue in the in the Quran as as in the Bible. Also, uh, most ancient cultures have a story about a flood, and in, in not only the Middle East but other places. Uh, one of the few exceptions, actually, is the Egyptian culture doesn't have anything about a flood, and archaeologists say that you know. Uh, a few thousand years before, like Moses and Abraham, there, uh, you know, like, you know, according to regular chronology, four or five thousand BC, uh, Egypt was underwater, and there wasn't anybody living in Egypt. So people in Egypt were kind of relatively latecomers. So of course they wouldn't have a flood story. But but Egyptian tradition even says all Egypt was underwater, and then and then they they, they came there. So except for the Egyptians, there are uh, lots of different flood stories. So um, th there's, uh, I guess. Uh, is there is does he have a belief that God was incapable of doing a, a, a global flood, or if he is not doing the you know the evidence is like there's nothing. Well, from that, that and like I said, I didn't want to get into all the scientific evidence here because uh, you know that's not really where I want to send this thing. That's why there's so many other books available out there that deal with this, and I give the reference. But he. The evidence he, he cited for that was, to me, was unconvincing. It's stuff you've seen in the, in the higher critical uh, works that also attack the, the, the flood as being global, and they try to say it was a local flood. And, and uh, you know, it's along those same lines where uh, uh, Moses didn't really part the Red Sea. The Egyptians, you know, they were able to walk across an ankle foot water or something like that. And, you know, they, it didn't really, it didn't really convince me of much of anything as far as that goes. Yeah, but one thing I might want to point out is that all Muslims don't necessarily think the same and everything. Uh, for example, one of the highest religious leaders today in Saudi Arabia, uh, named Mufti Sheikh Abdul Aziz bin Abdullah, uh, he uh, he says, for example, that Charles Darwin's theory of evolution, uh, it, it uh, Islam categorically rejects. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so, or, or, and, and that's from the BBC News, which is, we quoted from the Watchman Fellowship Update magazine, which is in April 2001. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they say that evolution, at least atheistic evolution, could not have occurred. Christians say atheistic evolution could not have occurred. And, you know, we're pretty much all uh, agreed on that part. That's right. And that's another thing I'd like to mention on that point for our viewers at home again. This Acts and Facts from the Institute for Creation Science, if you really want to go after this religion of evolution, and that's all it is, this Charles Darwinism religion of uh, the Big Bang and, and we all evolved from monkeys and stuff like that. Uh, check into this organization or contact us and we'll give you their mailing address to deal with this whole religion of evolution. Uh, it, it, that's all it is. It's just a, another religious idea to get out of the idea that God did it. And that's why that's why they believe in evolution. Now let's go to this next tape, tape 9, the Quran and Modern Science Parts 5 and 6. And I've got the reference for 3921 right here. And uh, also I've got the reference for uh, Surah 757. I'll let you do the B thing. All right. And the people at home at home can say can can see point A, Surah 3921, Surah 757, etc. make obvious statements about rain, clouds, water and wind. B <laughs> it happens to be B dance mm -hmm. mentioned in Surah 16, 68 through 69. The Quran talks about shadows, and in C, Badawi says all these things prove that the Quran was not authored from another source, but it had to be divine. So, 
he's saying that uh, this, this is scientific evidence in the Quran that proves that the uh, Quran had to be from God, not from some other source. And when I look at uh, Surah 39, verse 21, and I'll just read it. It says, Seest thou not that God sends down rain from the sky and leads it through springs in the earth? Then he causes to grow therewith produce of various colors. Then it withers. Thou wilt see it grow yellow. Then he makes it dry up and crumble away. Truly in this is a message of re remembrance to men of understanding. Well, I understand this. And I understand that this verse starts out, that God sends down rain from the sky. And this is Badawi's scientific evidence that this must be from God. I, I understand that. Uh, the rain comes from the sky. Well, what about this other passage? 757. It says here in the Quran, It is he who sendeth the winds like heralds of glad tidings going before his mercy. When they have carried the heavy laden clouds... We drive them to a land that is dead, make rain and descend thereon, and, and produce every kind of harvest therewith. Thus shall we raise up the dead, perchance you may remember. Okay, here's the other scientific evidence in this particular situation that Badawi brings out. He says God sends the winds like heralds, and uh, the, the, the winds are, the clouds are kind of carried along, with the wind, and, and we get some rain also. So we get rain coming from the sky. We got wind blowing. There's clouds being blown by the wind. And out of some of these clouds come rain. Now, I don't know about you, but it sounds to me like anybody could have written this. I, I think I might have written something like this when I was a kid in elementary school and I had to write a write something about you know the world around me. I think I might have written somewhere that there was clouds in the sky and there might have been some wind blowing. I mean, you know. <laughs> so I'm totally unconvinced by his argument here that the, the Quran has to be divine because of these verses. Yeah, I and, see nothing there. Go and, 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 if, and if this is convincing to a Muslim I, or to anybody, I guess that's news to us. And I would be interested in y'all writing us and letting us know, <laughs> enlightening us and why this was con a convincing argument to you. Right. Now you got the bees here. All, all, all the right. Quran. Well, what does what it say all right, there? Before I read verses 68 and 69, let me just say that verses 67 and 70, the verses before and after, have nothing to do with B, so this is going to be the entire context. Okay, now, uh, uh, but uh, we said that the, the B dance is, it is evidence of mon you know that of scientific truth. Well, modern science knows that when bees look for flowers and they find uh, flowers and they return to their hive, they dance in a uh, particular pattern to let the other bees know um, where you know the flowers were. Now, we can agree with Badawi that ancient man, by their natural abilities at that time, would know nothing about this. Okay, so let me read this two uh, verses and see what you can see about a bee dance. It says, For thy Lord taught the bee to build its cells in hills, on trees, and in men's habitations, then to eat all the produce and they had, of the earth, and follow the ways of of thy Lord made smooth. There issues from within their bodies a drink of varying colors, wherein is healing for men. Sounds like almost uh, honey or something. <laughs> Verily, and this is a sign for those who, who give thought. Now, there is nothing in here about a bee dance. The only thing that I could surmise that Badawi saw was it said, the ways of thy Lord made smooth. Now, in Yusuf Ali, there's a footnote that says there are actually two possible meanings here. One meaning is it made their ways easy and spacious so that the bees can, can navigate you know, from long distances. Or the other meanings might be you know, the bees have humility and obedience you know, as I guess serve the queen and answer the other bees. So, he, so Yusuf Ali says it's not clear which meaning is, is meant, but neither meaning is anything about a bee dance. And that's the only thing that I could see that would remotely be. So uh, basically, Badawi has, has taken something uh, that even other Muslims don't recognize as anything like a bee dance and, and, and put his own meaning into it. And it, uh, I would guess you would agree, Steve, this is totally unconvincing as far as evidence for a scientific origin that would lead to a divine source. Well, it's not evidence for that, but I think it is actually genuine evidence about maybe the quality of some of Badawi's arguments. <laughs>
<laughs> well said. Okay, with that, let's go on to uh, some of other uh, Baddeley's tapes. Tapes 10 and 11, we've kind of combined them. It's, it's uh, more uh, about the same thing. What you have here, basically, is Baddeley talks a lot about sex education in these tapes, tapes uh, 10 and 11, and he uh, says there are errors in the translation of the Quran, including a Yusuf Ali's translation, which distorts some of the text he wishes to use to support his arguments. And I'm not going to go into much detail here, and I don't, Steve, because we've got to hurry along and okay. get this material, but he talks a lot about sex. He brings up a lot of these surahs in the Quran, and they're in there just talking about sex, you know, the male and the female and the semen of the male and things of this nature and the women and their wombs and all this type of stuff and that always just takes a long time talking about all that stuff but uh, I don't see anything in it any more convincing than what we just showed you about the wind, the rain, the bees, the clouds it's just stuff any normal human being could observe and say something about that's that's really all you're getting here, and, and, and Baddowie spends hour after hour just talking about this stuff, just giving references about sex, and saying, ah, you see, it has to be from God, because who else could know this, and all this time. But once again, I find it to be totally unconvincing. Now, he does say something here about the errors in translation. Uh, what I found him doing in these texts about sex, there are some that he wanted to make a particular argument using the word from the, the Arabic or something so he could make it say something other than the way it was translated by A. Yusuf Ali or one of these other guys. And he would try to argue, well, uh, this should, was translated poorly by Ali. It should be this. And when he can change it to this other meaning, then he has this, this kind of twisted argument he can make about sex and how it ties to science and therefore the Quran is, is, is divine. But still, I found it to be unconvincing, and he's unsupported by his own translators, such as A. Yusuf Ali. Well, uh, we don't say that Yusuf Ali was necessarily perfect either. Um, for example, he talks about the, the, there is no Hebrew manuscript that we have that was bu before 916 A.D. And this is, this is in his footnote after Surah 5 on page 331 uh, in my copy of Yusuf Ali's translation. Bear in mind, some page numbers are different, like uh, Larry's copy has little different page numbers. But he apparently didn't know about the Dead Sea Scrolls, even though they've been out for you know a number of decades. Also, Yusuf Ali in page 334 mentions the Gospel of Barnabas, which kind of destroys his credibility on that point, and that's in page 334. So we're not saying Yusuf Ali is perfect, but, you know, hopefully he did translate like most of it okay. There you go. Okay, uh, with that said, uh, we'd like to, I'd like to go back to uh, Baddowie's tapes now. We're going to move on to his next, next tape, and that's going to be tape number 12, Linguistic Miracle of the Quran, as you can see there on your screen. Perpetual Challenge. Okay, Badawi makes in his first point here, point A, the Quran is not like any other book that preceded it. B, the Quran is so eloquent. C, the Quran is written, quote, in the beauty of the Arabic, end quote. D, there's the magic of the Quran. And E, the perpetual challenge to make up ten surahs or just one surah. Dr. Badawi says it cannot be done. Badawi does not mention the Hadiths either in this particular aspect of it. He's mainly talking about the linguistic miracle of the Quran. He's talking about how wonderful the Quran is, how it has a magic to it, and when you're reading it, you get a certain feeling about it that, that, that he calls and describes as magic. Uh, of course, that reminds me of uh, the Mormon missionaries that come to your door and they knock and they're trying to represent, uh, you know, the Church of Jesus Christ, the Latter-day Saints, and, and uh, they've got this Book of Mormon they want you to believe, and, and they say, uh, just pray about it, follow the Book of James, pray about it, and, and you, you'll get a burning in your bosom, you know, that it's true. It doesn't matter about facts or evidence. The Mormon missionaries want you to get a feeling that the Book of Mormon is true, and they're convinced that if you pray about it, and you're going to know that from this burning in your bosom that the Book of Mormon is true. But of course, you know, I, I've always said about Mormon missionaries, they really want to get more con converse with that kind of argument about a burning in your bosom, about a feeling. Well, then they ought to, you know, hand out jalapenos to their their people that to, to have first, and. Then they'll get the desired results. They'll definitely have a burning in their bosom, and then they'll have to conclude, oh, the Book of Mormon must be true. But anyway, um, you can see this is where the magic 
comes in for Dr. Badawi. The magic of the Quran? Is magic considered a good thing according to Islam? Narrated Aisha, magic was worked on the prophet so that he began to fancy that he was doing a thing which he was not actually doing. One day he invoked Allah for a long period and then said, I feel that Allah has inspired me as how to cure myself. This coming from Bukhari, volume 4, number 490, page 317. See also 4, 400, page 267, 8, 89, pages 56, 57, 8, 400, pages 266, 267, 7, 658 through 660, pages 441 through 443. In a sense, and he talks about the eloquence and the beauty of the Arabic language and the prose and the rhymes of, of, of the Quran, the way it reads. And he, and he goes into all this uh, uh, majestic language of how, how the uh, Quran is so wonderful and people would, you know, they, they would start crying and they'd get emotional by hearing these 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 verses and prose of the eloquence of the Arabic language of the Quran. And so he goes into all this kind of argumentation on why the Quran is a linguistic miracle. 12c, Quran is written in the beauty of the Arabic. Islamic scholar C.G. Fander points out that, quote, it is by no means the universal opinion of unprejudiced Arabic scholars that the literary style of the Quran is superior to that of all other books in the Arabic language, end quote. For example, quote, some doubt whether in eloquence and poetry it surpasses the Mu'alakat or the Magamat or Hariri, though in Muslim lands few people are courageous enough to express such an opinion, end quote. This comes from C.G. Fander, his book, The Balance of Truth, Revised and Enlarged, by W. St. Clair Tisdall, page 264, as quoted from Answering Islam by Geisler and Salib. And uh, then he gives this perpetual challenge that, uh, well, it's so wonderful, it's so eloquent, it's, it's so magical that uh, nobody can duplicate that miracle of uh, even recreating these kind of surahs with the magic of the Quran, or even doing one surah, can they reduplicate what's here? So therefore, Dr. Badawi concludes that the Quran must be of God because of all these reasons I've just described. 12e, the perpetual challenge? The original version of Surah 53, 19 through 20, which was said to have been originated by Satan through Muhammad, according to at least four early authoritative Islamic biographers. Quote, Have you seen Lot and Uza and another, the third goddess, Manat? These are the exalted cranes, intermediaries, whose intercession is to be hoped for. Here we have what is known in the Islamic world as the satanic verses. So apparently the devil himself as confirmed by Islamic sources, Muslim sources rather than any other sources, says that Muhammad spoke by Satan in the Quran. And this verse, of course, was later abrogated. Now, Steve, uh, I think you had some information about this perpetual challenge thing. All right. Well, well I have a couple of things. Uh, some things, and, and I'll be reading from uh, uh, Norm Geisler and Abdul Salib's book, an uh, excellent book, oh, yeah. and Answering Islam. In fact, we highly recommend that. Who publishes that? Uh, I believe it's published by, uh, it's by Baker Books. Baker Books, Answering Islam. We recommend this to anyone that's interested in this subject and wants some good Christian apologetic information dealing with this subject, but go ahead. All right. All right. Well, well, just to get to give uh, a, a couple of things, kind of like a, a contrasting viewpoint to that, um, just to see the beauty or perhaps lack thereof. In Surah 109, part of it says, "Say, O ye that reject faith, I worship not that which ye worship, nor will ye worship that which I worship, and I will not worship that which ye have been wont to worship, nor will ye worship that which I worship. To you be your way, and to be me be mine." 
sounds kind of pretty repetitious there. Uh, the other thing uh, in this book, and I was on page 189, on page 187, according to the Iranian uh, scholar Ali Dashti, he says, the Quran contains sentences which are incomplete and not fully intelligible without the aid of commentaries, foreign words, unfamiliar Arabic words, and words used with other than the normal meaning. Adjectives and verbs inflicted without observance of the concord of gender and number. Illogically and ungrammatically applied pronouns which sometimes have no referent. And predicates in which, which in rhyme passages are often remote from the subjects. And he gives uh, plenty of examples in the book to where, you know, uh, in Arabic you have the singular, you have the dual, and you have the plural in cases to where it's, it uses the plural and it should use, use the dual in, in cases to where the, the other tense and conjugation of the verb was actually incorrect in the Quran. And, and this is even in spite of the fact that the Quran originally was written down with just the consonants, not the vowels. So there's like, you know, some uncertainty in that you could put in one set of vowels and get one word and occasionally put another set of vowels and, and get a different word. Now, as to about there's no surah uh, that, that can be made like it, well, I guess uh, people have done various things and various poetries where they've claimed that, that they have, you know, duplicated the style and, of course, a Muslim can simply say, no, it doesn't look close enough or whatever. But I guess what I would point to is in the Sahih Muslim, it talks about a lost surah of the Quran. And it, and it talks about surah, and certainly it would be the same style because if it's from Muhammad and it was originally in the Quran, uh, but it talked about a, a great valley and, and uh, full of riches and if Adam wanted it because of greed, you know, he'd want, it, he'd want to go to another one like it. Uh, but, but basically, you know, it's like, well, you don't even have all the surahs in there that were originally there. So. Well, that kind of reminds me also of some of the other... Uh, uh, hadiths that talk about how uh, there are uh, great teachings of Muhammad that were left out, that were left out of uh, the uh, the Quran. In fact, it reminds me, since we're mentioning this, I've, uh, there's a book called Surah Al Sul Allah of Ibiz Haq, and it's uh, the very earliest biography and collection of the traditions of the life of Muhammad in biographical form, and on page. 684, he talks about Uma speaking and this law that Muhammad taught about stoning people who commit adultery. And uh, he gives other references and so forth, but you have in the, uh, the, the Hadiths uh, where it's claimed by these other people, and there's, there's plenty of documentation for this, that uh, this great teaching on adultery and stoning is is left out of the Quran, and uh, yet they were taught it at the time. So, and, and I'm also reminded about this this the beauty of the Arabic and things that we we're talking about here. That uh, there's uh, a great work by author Jeffrey. We're going to bring this up later in a, in this series. But author Jeffrey did a, a a study of the different foreign words used in the Quran uh, that aren't Arabic at all. And uh, uh, we'll, we'll get into that a little bit later, but that, that kind of ties into this subject. Mm -hmm. well, let's move on to the next tape then by Dr. Jamal Badawi here in our uh, Islam Apologist series, tape 13. This one's entitled The Linguistic Miracle of the Quran, parts 1 and 2 and beyond. And he, he argues that the Quran is beyond human capacity. And reading the points here, Battery repeats his challenges for anyone to duplicate the style and beauty of the Quran. Point two, or B here, Badawi says the Quran has a feeling that you just cannot mix with man's works. Badawi does not mention the book uh, Mormon Feelings, which I mentioned a moment ago. Uh, C, Badawi admits that there is a big difference between style, beauty, eloquence, and sayings in the Hadith with that of the Quran. D, the uniqueness of the Quran, where it mentions the laws against murder, uh, such as the fact that if the family of the murder party forgives the murderer, the murderer can be exempt from capital punishment. In some cases, forgiveness can be obtained by financial compensation, etc. Badawi says this is unique and is found only in Islamic law. So basically he says there's a uniqueness uh, of the Quran, such as you know the laws against murder and the, these certain things here. But but I'm not sure we'd want that one because that's basically saying that if if two people, let's say you have two murderers and one is wealthy and one's not, then if the family basically wants the money, the rich murderer can get off by paying, and the poor murderer you know, is, is stuck. 
And it's like, that doesn't seem very equitable. Well, there. There, well, see, there you go, looking at things from an ethical point of view, you can see. But this isn't what Badawi is talking about here. Badawi is talking about a unique law, okay? Okay. <laughs> That's unique to the uh, Quran. In other words, I agree with your point, but, <laughs> mm-hmm. but I don't think he was looking for, for that. He's, he's trying to show that the Quran has laws that are unique to Islam itself and nothing else. Mm-hmm. But, of course, from a Christian point of view, I, I see this as totally unethical. Right. Uh, the very example he brings up is something I would dis- would, would say disproves uh, the Quran as being of divine origin because one thing the Muslims always say is that uh, Christians and Jews and Muslims worship the same God, mm-hmm. but the God of uh, the, the Christians and the Jews of the Old Testament, New Testament, uh, wouldn't go along with the law. There, like there, this there, there, at was, all. there was no ransom for uh, a, a rich man couldn't get off for murder in, in, in the Old Testament. Right. So you see, it, right there, it disproves this idea that the same God wrote this book. So, anyway, uh, going on in these points to finish this this particular tape up, the Quran cannot be improved upon. The prose, rhymes, poetry, literature of the Quran cannot be matched. Uh, letter G, Badawi, and these are just uh, biographical information that Badawi gave on the tape, that he's an Egyptian from outside of Cairo, Egypt. And uh, also, Badawi compliments Muslim apologist Ahmad Didat. So, uh, a lot of this is what we just covered a minute ago in, in tape 12. It's kind of a repetitious of that, but uh, and I've already answered some of this from the, the previous tape. Concerning Badawi's challenge to duplicate the style and beauty of the Quran, what about the verses canceled out of the Quran? For example, quote, We used to read a verse of the Quran revealed in their connection, but later the verse was canceled. It was, quote, Convey to our people on our behalf the information that we have met our Lord, and he is pleased with us, and has made us pleased, end quote. This coming from the Islamic reference, Al-Bakari, volume 5, 416, page 288. Can the Quran be improved upon? Which Quran? The Quran today can be improved upon. How? First of all, factually. There are a number of factual errors in the Quran. For example, Surah 17, verse 1 says that Allah took Muhammad one night to the mosque in Jerusalem on spectacular journey. There was no mosque in Jerusalem in Muhammad's lifetime. There was no Jewish temple there either. Secondly, morally, many see moral deficiency in Surah 9, verse 29, quote, fight those who believe not even if they be people of the book, meaning Christians and Jews, until they have willingly agreed to pay the jizya tribute in recognition of their submissive state, end quote. Regardless, the original Quran in Muhammad's time was improved upon with various verses and surahs abrogated. If one says, Muhammad wrote it, so Muhammad had the right to change it, that would mean it was not from Allah. After Muhammad died, it was standardized by Uthman and an earlier version of Ubay's Quran with two fewer surahs was suppressed. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Well, there's one kind of interesting thing. Uh, I, I read on the web there was an article uh, by a Muslim about Didat called Didat and the Balance, and it was very critical of, of, of Didat, and it was by a fellow Muslim, and the reason it was critical is that Didat was basically saying that, you know, there's some kind of some similarities between Shiite and Sunni, and kind of saying there's some commonality, and he was kind of, um, uh, kind of almost a little bit partial towards Sufism. Mm-hmm. And this particular Muslim, uh, I, I don't remember the author, I know it wasn't Badawi though, um, it was basically really castigating Dadad as kind of close to a heretic for, you know, for, for, for kind of saying positive things about, you know, about aspects of Sufism and mm-hmm. saying he was almost like a closet Sufi. And, and I'm not, I don't know enough to say that that's true or not, but Sufism is a very different, I guess, animal. Why a Muslim questions Dadad's orthodoxy? One. Didat acknowledges learning much of what he knows of Islam by Joseph 
Purdue, who is a Baha'i. Two, the dot calls Rashad Khalifa a great servant of Islam for using numerology of the number 19 to expose the last two verses of Surah 9 in today's Quran as false. Number three, Rashad Khalifa apparently calls those who believe in the Hadith along with the Quran false Muslims and idol worshipers. Four, while most Muslims believe Jesus was not on the cross, the dot believes that Jesus was on the cross, but he did not die. He only fainted. The references for this are found on the website media.isnet.org slash A-N-T-A-A-R slash E-T-C slash the dot balance dot H-T-M-L as of 8-31-2001. And anyone that wants more information on that, we have done a series on these different uh, uh, Muslim groups and we, we've covered the Sufis, we covered the Alawites, the Sunnis, the Shiites, right. and uh, we have a complete uh, video series on that that our viewers are welcome to uh, access through this ministry. Yeah, and, 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 and we have written material too if, if you're interested on Rumi right. and on the Hafez, uh, on the Divan. And, Hafez. and so there's a very, uh, although we can't confirm it here at this moment, but uh, I think there's a very good chance based on all the differences in beliefs of the Muslim sects and groups you got the Shiites, the Muslims, I mean the, uh, the Sunnis, you've got Alawites, you've got uh, all these other groups that have different and varying very beliefs. Gulag groups, yeah. Gulag groups. Uh, there's a very good chance that Dr. Badawi may have some serious disagreements with Ahmad Didat on issues, but they're not going to say because they're so busy trying to attack the Christians. And, uh, uh, in fact, uh, let me just say at this point, we're talking about Ahmad Didat. I have a clip of him I'd like to play for our viewers to listen to. Uh, this is another Muslim apologist. And you get a flavor of, of what we're dealing with here in these Muslim apologists and their attitude towards other religions, particularly Christianity and the Bible. I'll just uh, hit the tape. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, ye shall by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. This is the Mahdi Dot. There's no heaven for you. This is what he says. These are his words. And what is happening is you are not contradicting his words. This is Islam. Unless you are better than the Jew, there is no heaven for you. He didn't say it's a blood, but your righteousness. You must be better than the Jew. You must fast as the Jews fasted, but on a higher level. You must pray as the Jews prayed, but on a higher level. You must give charity as the Jews gave charity, but on a higher level. And that is Islam. So, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I say that this resurrection, as has been addressed by Josh in America under the heading Hopes of History, I would conclude that here are 1,000 million people are being taken for a ride on a cross. They are being taken for a ride on a cross. In Durban, every week, we have our horses taking thousands of people for a ride, every horse. But here, yeah, eh, you are being taken for a ride on a cross. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. That was done in South Africa, and there, uh, that was at a debate, right, uh, where the dot was debating against Josh McDowell. We've already referenced many times to his books that we have back here behind us, the evidence that demands a verdict and so forth. And uh, there he's saying that Christians are ta being taken for a ride on a cross, and he's also arguing for the fact that you have to do good works and do uh, this righteousness and all these types of things. Uh, but that is one of the people that Dr. Badawi respects and, and, and says good things about in his tape series. And uh, basically, as you heard him, he was, he was kind of being facetious there. And he's saying, you Christians, you're being taken for a ride on a cross. And of course, he does, in Islam, they don't believe Jesus died on a cross. They don't believe he resurrected. He mentioned something about yeah. that too. Enemies of the cross. Right. Yeah. So he uh, he's a big enemy of Christianity. And uh, of course, Dr. Badawi uh, likes him and mentions him here. One other thing I'll say about this before we move on as time flies. I, I mentioned, uh, I missed one point. That Dr. Badawi also said, if you look back at the screen on, on, the, on the 
the TV there, it says, people find new meanings to the same old texts of the Quran. This is unique, Badawi says. So uh, uh, basically, uh, Dr. Badawi is saying from reading the Quran, you can look at the passages of Scripture and you can come up with a new interpretation that suddenly uh, means that you get a new meaning out of it. And, and that proves the divine origin of the Quran because uh, maybe people for 10 years looked at a, that certain verse and they never saw something and then all of a sudden another guy comes along and he sees it and he sees a new meaning out of it and that, and that shows the divine origin. But to me, all that proves is confusion because uh, I found that people can take any book, whether it's the Quran or the Bible or anything, and they can... In, Interpret it a million different ways. Or a fortune telling book. Exactly, Batman. exactly. So once again, this argument saying you can get a new meaning proves nothing at mm -hmm. all. I think it's just a logical fallacy in this case. New meanings in the Quran. Sufis and Alawites, for example, find radically new meanings in the Quran. These meanings are not what Badawi had in mind. Modern, that's anti Sharia. Muslims find all kinds of verses in the Quran that are abrogated, meaning deleted. Conservative Muslims, however, disagree that verses were abrogated from the Quran. Let's move on to tape 14. It's on your screen there, the linguistic miracle of the Quran, parts 3 and 4. And the first argument there is, in Surahs 3 and 5, the Quran says people reject the truth because of their parents. Also, uh, point B, the Quran uses rhymes. C, Badawi admits that the Quran is redundant in some places. For example, Surah 6, 151, and Surah 1731. Uh, verse, uh, verses are virtually the same, but the words are reversed and altered. And I'll, uh, I'll actually look at that in a second. Uh, Steve, any quick comments here before I go to the Quranic text that were just brought up? Uh, yeah, uh, when uh, Badawi says that, that people often reject the truth because of their parents, um, there's actually some, unfortunately, some truth to that, in that people often are a particular religion, not because they've thought about it, but just because they're, they're, their parents are that way. Uh, one uh, Muslim friend of mine explained to me in a way I'd never really considered before. He said, your religion is like your child. And this was after September 11th he told me this. He said that, you know, you may be disappointed in your child. You may be angry at your child, but he's still your child. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, you know, I thought about that later and I thought, well, hold on a second here. Is that, you know, your religion is, what you, is maybe what a person is banking on for their eternal life. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, if you're going the wrong way, it's like then you've got to choose between your religion and between God. And, you know, there was a man who, who totally rejected his parents' religion, and he's respected by both Muslims and Christians, and his name was Abraham. And, 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 and Abraham rejected his religion, his idolatrous religion of Ur, and he followed the true God. And that's what we're asking for you today. We're asking, if you're a Muslim, is to reject Muhammad and to look for, for the true God, and we think you'll find Christianity. If you are a Christian and you are a Christian, just because it's kind of like your culture or because it's your parents, we ask you to search for the truth too, and that you will find the, the truth in Christianity, but you still need to, to, to search. You just can't, you know, you know, someone said God has no grandchildren. You're either a child of God or you're not a child of God, but you're not a grandchild of God. You either have a relationship with Him or you don't, but you can't say, well, I belong to God just because of my parents. Right. And I'd like to mention here where uh, Dr. Badawi brings up these two surahs, Surah 6, 151, and Surah 17, 31. Uh, here I've got uh, Surah 6 before me. I'm not going to read the whole surah, but I will read the key part. It says, Kill not your children on a plea of want. We provi provide sustenance for you and for them. And then when you go to the other, other one in uh, 1731, it says, Kill not your children for fear of want. We shall provide sustenance for them. And uh, well, for you, kind of reverse order. Right, right. So it kind of reverses, and Dr. Battery brings this out. But what I thought was fascinating about this, he's, he's, he's talking about these things, and this is supposed to be proving the, the Quran, you might say. But uh, I want you to listen to this next clip from another Muslim apologist. This is from another debate that a Muslim apologist had, and this one was with uh, Dr. James White. Uh, this uh, apologist's name here is, uh, uh, I think I have it here, Hamza Abdul Malik. And he'll be the next 
uh, clip coming up. Dude, I, want you to read. Three, three I wanted you to read. Okay, here, listen to him. Mark chapter 12, verse 8, and then read the they same thing. They took him and thing. killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. Verse 39, they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Okay, now, what happened there? What's, what's so the difference? So, you, so what you're saying is, in one, in one place, he's killed and then thrown out, and the other... He is thrown out and then killed, and yeah. that is the basis yeah. for saying and that these this are is not, to be the same. These are interpolations. This is the same story inspired by God. You're telling us. So the idea with, with a major flaw like this in it, major, it changes the story around. If the somebody major comes, flaw, the major flaw of the parable, and since I'm asking the question, the major flaw of the parable is that when when these inspired writers record this for us, uh, and the main point is they reject Jesus, mm -hmm. that because one says they throw him out and kill him, the other says they kill him and throw him out, that that's a kind of no, I don't even agree with what you mean. I say that the parable goes much further than what you just uh, asserted. That the uh, time is up. Okay, thank you. thank you. What we have here is is Malik is is saying in this debate with James White, the Christian. So it's a the Muslim versus the Christian in this debate. He's saying that the Bible can't be trusted and it's not divine or inspired because there's two passages in the gospel records that one says they. they uh, took him out and killed him, and the other one says they uh, killed him and then took him out, or something like that, right. you know, and it's just the same story, but just the words are slightly reversed, and and the Muslim apologist is saying, oh, it can't be from God, it's false, it's not true, and of course, James White's going there, well, are you telling me these are interpolations just because of that, and, and a Muslim apologist is serious in his attack on the Bible, but then, when you look at these passages that we just looked at in the Quran, by the Muslim's argument right there that you just heard, he'd have to say the same thing about the Quran in these right. two passages, Surah 6 and Surah 17, because uh, it's saying the same thing, but the words are just slightly changed around. So you'd have to throw the Quran out if you follow that Muslim's argument. So uh, I, I couldn't resist just showing what, uh, what Muslim apologists will do to try to attack the Bible. And a lot of times they attack the Bible without even realizing that what they're saying, which doesn't really make any sense anyway, actually ends up attacking their own religion at the same time. Right. The Quran used rhymes. Pre-Islamic Arab poets used rhymes too. Some of their poetry was lewd and idolatrous. Since then, many poets have used rhymes. It is baffling why Dr. Badawi feels the need to include rhymes as evidence of a miracle. Perhaps his evidence is simply weak. Now let's go to back to this tape uh, and see what other points here are on tape 14. Uh, D, it says, in Islamic paradise, Badawi says, no effort, everything comes to you. E, Badawi says that the Quran is here today exactly as Muhammad and the angel directed it. F, Surah 2, the cow is the longest surah with 286 verses. It took nine years to reveal, uh, dealing with over 80 different circumstances, revealed in small parts at a time. G, the Quran is distinctive from prophetic sayings of the prophet in the Hadith. H, Badawi admits that there is no rigid chronological order to the Quran. And I, Badawi dismisses Quranic compilers' mistakes, but offers no refutation of these problems, which are mentioned in the Hadith. So uh, what we have here is just a, another list of things that we've kind of talked about before. Uh, some is just straight up information like Surah 2 being the longest with 286 verses. Uh, it's uh, the Quran. We've already mentioned the Quran uh, is more poetic and has rhymes and like the Hadith, which may be more raw and more conversational uh, talking than you would get in the prose of the Quran. Uh, he, I did think it was interesting, he's mentioning the, the uh, Islamic paradise, that there's no effort, everything comes to you. And we'd yeah. already mentioned in the previous show that the big difference between Islamic paradise and Christian or the biblical paradise is that in the biblical paradise we're with God and we're worshiping God and everything. But in Islamic paradise, it's like you're sitting there in this easy chair or recliner and these guys are bringing you a glass of wine or, and you got these beautiful women all over you and everything's coming to you. So I guess Badawi has a point there, mm -hmm. as a matter of fact. In Islamic paradise, quote, no effort, everything comes to you, end quote. Muslim paradise has free-flowing alcohol, 72 virgins per martyr, this does not really appeal to Muslim women, and is basically a sensual place. Who can blame the corrupt Abbasid caliphs, one of whom drowned in a swimming pool of alcohol? 
Apparently, all they wanted to do was simply enjoy Muslim paradise a little bit early. Quran here today is exactly as Muhammad dictated it. Badawi is misinforming others here. Quote, then Allah revealed to us a verse that was among the canceled ones later on. End quote. That coming from Al-Bukhari, volume 5, number 416, page 288. Quote, narrated Anas bin Malik. There was revealed about those who were killed at Be'ir Ma'una, a Quranic verse we used to recite, but it was canceled later on. The verse was, quote, inform our people that we have met our Lord. He is pleased with us, and he has made us pleased, end quote. That coming from Al-Bukhari, volume number 4, number 69, page 53. Other references to canceled verses are Bukhari, volume 4, number 57, page 45. Bukhari, volume 4, number 299, page 191. Bukhari, volume 5, number 416, page 288. And Bukhari, volume 5, number 421, page 293. Any other comments you'd like to make on some of these? Uh, no, uh, we have a, a whole show that we did on changes in the Quran. So you can sort of, if they say the Quran's unchanged, say, okay, well, which Quran? Uh, you know, one, one, one version didn't even have Surah 1 in it, I mean, the entire Surah. Mm -hmm. And uh, Arthur Jeffrey, according to Answering Islam, sa says that he has found, I think it's over 50 changes in Surah 2 alone. Right, which uh, that he was referencing to. But once again, these arguments that Badawi is making for why the Quran is, a, is divine and is a linguistic miracle, we find totally unconvincing. We're going to tape 15 in this set by Dr. Badawi. The title of that tape is, Did the Quran Pre-Exist Before Its Revelation? Uh, point A, Badawi says the surahs of the Quran were revealed piecemeal, not at one time in one place. B, Badawi says of the 23 years of the revelations of the Prophet Muhammad, 13 years of revelations were given in Mecca, and 10 years were given in Medina. C. Badawi says the piecemeal fashion of its year of revelation of the Quran proves the Quran pre-existed. D. Badawi says 82 surahs were given in Mecca and 20 surahs were given in Medina, although Badawi admits that there are 12 surahs uh, where there is disagreement among scholars as to where they came from, either Mecca or Medina. Badawi believes the intermixed surahs and verses of the Quran proves there must, that this must be from God. Example of that, Badawi says that Surah 5 was given in Medina, but Surah 5.3 was given in Mecca. So you've got this main surah that was given in one place, but there's like a verse in there that came from the other place. And then uh, number two, Badawi says Surah 6 was given in Mecca, but Surah 6.20 was given in Medina. So once again, you got a little piece of it that came from the other place and came about later. And he's saying that this proves that there's a divine origin to the Quran. As a, as a quick example, uh, I actually had an article I, I wrote called, Is Defense Really Necessary? You can see my name there. Hmm. Larry Wessels. This is done back in 1973. This is a March-April issue of 1973, a long time ago when I was just a kid. But what's funny about this article I wrote is I wrote this article over a two-year period. I wrote it, uh, I remember I left it laying on the floor in my room for like six months at least. And then I'd write a little bit more of it, and then I'd leave it laying there again. And I kind of put it together piecemeal, like Dr. Battle was talking about. And eventually I finally slapped it all together and mailed it in. And lo and behold, Avalon Hill published my article and I got some freak stuff. Yeah, I got some more freak war games and stuff like this. But does that mean, does this mean because I did this piecemeal over a long period of time and these papers were laying on the floor in my room and, you know, now and then I get around to writing some more on, does that mean that this is a divinely inspired article on how to play a, you know, these war games? I don't think so, Larry. <laughs> <laughs> so you see, to, using the same logic that Badawi's doing about the piecemeal nature of the Quran. I mean, it just reminded me of my article that was just laying on the floor, you know, and sometimes I get the, you know, the, the dirty laundry off of it to say, oh yeah, this is down here, I ought to write a little bit more on it, you know. But, but uh, see, it, it, see, his argument proves nothing, proves nothing at all. And uh, I'd like to say as we close, 
Uh, we have a newsletter that's available to anyone who wants to call or write us for here at Christian Answers. Uh, we've got our websites up at the end of the show. You can contact our email address. We have tracts and literature available free of charge on this subject and other subjects. Just give us a call or write us. I'm Larry Wessels with Steve Morrison for Christian Answers. Thank you for being with us. Remember, Jesus is Lord. Believe and trust in Him. God bless you all.